Well, good morning, Boss Church eCampus. I am so excited to be here. I hope you are just as excited as I am. Today, we're going to worship every day that you wake up. Every day you open up your eyes is a day to worship God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to jump into these songs in a minute here. But if you don't mind, I want to pray with you and pray for you as we get started. Gracious Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you and honor you for who you are. This is your day. This is your day. We give it to you because you are a great and incredible God. We lay all our stuff, our burdens, our issues, our hopes, our dreams, we lay them at your feet because we know that with you, things will be all right. All good things come from you in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Y'all ready to worship? Come on, because I'm ready with you. Let's, let's get it together. Here we go. Woo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We serve a great God. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Our God is great and glorious. We put our trust in your name, Jesus. Faithful to save and deliver us. We put our hope in your name, Jesus. Blessings and honor, blessings and honor, glory and power unto our God forever and ever. All of the honor, all of the praise is yours. I 
Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Yeah, yeah. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Come on, lift those hands right where you are. If you want God to break into your life, break into your situation, break into your stuff like never before, now is the time, now is the moment for you to let him in. Open up your doors and let him in. Open up your heart and let him in. God wants to do a miracle in your life. He wants to give you the things that you desire. He wants you to do that. But you've got to be willing to put some stuff down. You got to be willing to lay down your past and lay down your hurt and lay down your pain. I love that the man in the Bible saying in Mark 9 says, God, I, I, I have faith, but, but help me. I have, help me with my unbelief right now. If you believe that God has a blessing for you, lift those hands and shout it out right now. God, I believe. Even when I don't see it, I believe it. If you believe, say it with me. I believe. One more time, say, I believe. God has something in store for you. God bless you. So let's just go ahead and bow our heads and just open up in prayer. Gracious and loving Father, we magnify and we exalt your holy name. Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise this morning because you and you alone are worthy. So oh God, I just want to, first of all, lift up Boss Church before you and just thank you for your hand being on our church. I thank you, God, that over the last several years that you've kept us, you've kept our doors open when so many churches have um, closed their doors. And not only that, Lord, but you've actually given us a purpose. We know that we are here to make a difference in this community, and we know that you're going to see us through that purpose. Father, I want to lift up our pastor before you, Pastor Darrell. We thank you, Lord, that you have given him a heart to serve you and to shepherd your people. We thank you, God, for the vision that you've given him. And we ask, Lord, that you would just continue to bless him and to give him encouragement and strength as he continues to attempt to work out the vision that you have for his, um, that you have given him. Lord, we ask that you would bless him, that he would lack no good or beneficial thing, and that all of his needs are met in his personal life as well as in his spiritual life and in the life of this church. Father, I lift up before you the congregation that's here today. For every brother and sister that's here, I pray, Lord, that we would all have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to receive the message that you have for us this day. Your word declares that when two or more are joined together in your presence, that in, in, in um, agreement with you, that you are amongst us. So, Father, we thank you for your presence here. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here. I pray that everything in me that's flesh, that it would just step aside and that you would rise up in me and that you would give me um, the ability to present the message today in confidence and in competency and with clarity. So I just humbly submit myself to you and ask that you would do what only you can do this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that God has blessed me with is um, the ability to teach the word. That's the gift that he's given me. He's given me a hunger and a desire and a thirst to just study his word. So while I've never been to seminary, I haven't taken any formal classes, I do 
search out the scriptures. So today, the teacher in me wants to start with a pop quiz. Yeah, I, I know, I know. But this is easy. It's just going to be one question, okay? And if you can relate to what I say, I'm going to lay out a scenario. If you can relate to it, then I just need you to indicate to me in some positive way. Raise your hand, say amen, whatever makes you comfortable, but just let me know that you can relate. Now, understand there is no right or wrong answer, so if you can't relate to it, that's okay. This is about you and what, you know, where you are in your relationship with Christ. You ready? Okay, so have you ever had a conversation with someone or maybe a conversation with God in your head. So this could be a live conversation, or maybe you're just talking to God. And if you're like me, you're talking to God in your head all the time, and you're answering God. So you've had this conversation, and it's about some area that the Holy Spirit's been convicting you on. So maybe the Holy Spirit is asking you to do something, and you just haven't done it yet. Or it could be in reverse. The Holy Spirit is asking you to stop doing something, and for some reason, you're still doing it. But the bottom line is you are being convicted about it, and you're making your excuses. Yeah, God, um, I would go serve over here, but you know how busy I am. Or, yeah, I know I need to go out and speak to this brother or sister and give them a word of encouragement, but, you know, I'm shy, and, and I just don't, you know, I'm just not there yet. And that's okay because, God, you know my heart, right? You know what's in here. So... If you have ever found yourself saying to God or to someone else that word or that phrase, God knows my heart, then if you can relate to that, raise your hand. Okay, so I am so glad to know that I am not alone in that area. So, <laughs> true story. This is about three years ago. I'm explaining to a friend of mine why I said no to God. And I'm giving all the right answers in my mind. Yeah, well, I just don't know enough, and I'm nervous, and God's still working on me, and so I'm just not ready. And so he says, well, you know, Julie, when God calls you to do something, he also equips you to do it. And so I said, yeah, I know, but God knows my heart. And he said, yeah, you're right. God does know your heart. But more importantly, do you know God's heart? So there I was, stuck right, right there. And um, I came to realize that knowing God's heart is so, so important. Because the more we know the heart of God, then the more likely we are to do the will of God and not to submit to our own will. So as I thought about it and as I was preparing for today, I realized that when we say, yeah, but, God, you know my heart, basically what we're saying is, yeah, God, not my will, not your will, my will. I know you're telling me to go here and do this, but I'm not ready. Not your will, my will. So today I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I did, I was thinking about, about the last seven months worth of Sundays, just about every message that pastor teaches and just about everybody who comes up and talks, they talk on the subject of deliverance. We've been hearing a lot about deliverance. And so today, I'm also going to talk about deliverance. And I want to do two things. I want to discuss deliverance and give you some information about it. But more importantly, I want to give you four spiritual truths that we can incorporate in our lives that will assist us and help us to be able to live a life of deliverance, for us to be able to live and walk in the victory that God wants for his people. Fair enough? Okay, so first thing, um, I truly, truly believe that God desires for us to live lives of deliverance. He wants us to be free from the chains that keep us captive and that prevent us from being the men and women that he called us to be, those things that prevent us from doing the work that he's called us to do. So in order to do that, we are really going to need to be delivered from some of the things that prevent us from doing the will of God. So before I start talking about what these truths are, just a, a couple of things that I want to talk about in terms of deliverance and um, what that means. First, let's define deliverance. 
The root word is deliver. The Webster Dictionary defines it as the act of delivering someone or something, thing. The state of being delivered. The action of being rescued, set free, pardoned, or forgiven. Now, there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that talk about deliverance, and they don't use that word deliver. Instead, they use words that are synonymous with deliver. So we know synonyms. Those are words that sound very different, but they basically mean the same thing. So here are some words that are syn synonymous with deliver or deliverance. Release, freeing, rescue, ransom, save, salvation, redeemed, redemption, restore. So when we go through deliverance scriptures, these are the kinds of words that we're going to see in the scriptures. We'll see deliver sometime, but a lot of times we're going to see these kinds of words. So as I'm talking today, I will be m saying things like saved and salvation, but we're still talking about deliverance. And um, let's see here. Right from the very beginning, what we know about God is this, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's, that's the first thing that we learn about God, that there is no variation in God. And so right from the very beginning, God has always had a plan to redeem and uh, deliver mankind. So even with his first covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his plan was restore the relationship that was lost back when Adam disobeyed and introduced the original sin into the world and our relationship with God was broken, his plan right away was to restore mankind back to him. He had that same plan with David, King David. He made a new covenant and new promises to David, and it's actually through David's line that Jesus came. And we know that Jesus is our hope. He's our deliverer. And Jesus established an even better covenant, the covenant of grace. We live under that covenant right now, and we know that the covenant of grace is God's gift to us for salvation. God wants to save us, redeem us from the loss, and bring us back to him. So God hasn't changed. Deliverance has always been important to God, and it will always be important to God this generation and in the generations to come right up until Christ returns. So um, did a little bit of talking. Let's, talk, let's look at some scriptures. One of the things that I enjoy doing is looking at God's word because I believe that God tells us everything that we need to know in his word. So, and we've already said God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we're discussing God and we're looking at God's word, we should be able to find God's word in the Old Testament and we should be able to find that same word in the New Testament, and then we should be applying that same word to our lives today. So um, I want you to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We're looking at an Old Testament scripture that will show God's heart and his plan for deliverance for his people. So while you're looking for that, just a little bit of background. This is after King Solomon has built the temple, he's had a huge celebration, God's blessed the temple, filled the temple with his presence, and Solomon's been praying to God. So God reveals himself to Solomon, and he reveals a promise to Solomon. Second Chronicles chapter 7, 14. And it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So, we know that God is omniscient. He knows everything. We know that he's om omnip omnipotent. He's all-powerful. God is talking to Solomon about something that's not going to occur for nine generations. He knows that when Solomon passes on that there will be nine generations of kings behind Solomon and many of those kings will be wicked and they will lead uh, periods of rebellion where the children of Israel are in rebellion against God and God knows he's going to address this rebellion he knows that that Jerusalem will fall that the temple will be destroyed and that the people will be exiled and they will be in Babylon for a period of time so here 
Nine generations before it happened, God is revealing his heart for deliverance because he doesn't intend to leave them there. He says he's going to hear them. He's going to forgive them, and he's going to heal the land. He's going to return them back to that place where they once were. Let's look at the New Testament scripture. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21, God reveals his heart for deliverance. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. Okay, everybody had a chance to get that? Okay, so here's what it says. This is Luke. He was a doctor, and he was basically traveling most of the time with the Apostle Paul on many of his missionary trips, and he's recording the life of, of Jesus Christ. So Luke writes, and he came to Nazareth. He is Jesus. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogues on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to pro proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim liberty, another word for deliverance, to the captives and recovering of sight, which is basically healing, to the, year, um, to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is Jesus' words. And even though his own people rejected him and his message, Jesus confirmed that he was the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy that was spoken by the prophet Hosea, uh, Isaiah, and that his purpose for coming was to deliver God's people, to heal and to, liber to liberate. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's what we need to know. When it comes to understanding, understanding the heart of God, it's important to understand that God has a heart for deliverance. God desires to set his people free. He wants to see his people walk and live in victory. And not just in a partial victory, but in complete vi victory in every area of our lives. He wants us to be free physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually. He basically, he wants us to be um, free from the things that seek to pull us away from him, that seek to prevent us from experiencing his deliverance and from living in victory. So anything that's going to interrupt that, that's what God wants us free for, from. So with that in mind, there's two things that we need to understand, and that's what we're going to be addressing today. First, we need to understand that all forms of deliverance are divine. They come from God. In order to experience divine deliverance and any kind of deliverance, we must have the power of God working in our lives. Without the power of God, there is no deliverance. Second, we need to know how to build a strong foundation for experiencing God's deliverance and for actually walking in victory. So there's some things that we need to do and have in place that help us in that. I'm going to talk a little bit about just deliverance in and of itself. There's all kinds of deliverance, different kinds of forms of deliverance, right? You can be delivered, you can be freed from bad habits and destructive behaviors, from addictive behaviors. Um, you can be set free from habitual, unrepentant sinning, whether it's lying or cheating or cursing or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, there's healing comes, uh, deliverance comes in the form of healing, right? From chronic il illnesses or injuries. Um, it comes in the form of rescue from imminent danger or threats. Sometimes we know about the danger. Sometimes God rescues us from dangers that we don't even know about. Um, it's freed from, deliverance comes um, as a form of freedom from any kind of mental or emotional chain that would seek to put us in bondage and prevent us from living a life that God's called us to live. But, Always, 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 deliverance is the result of the power of the Holy Spirit working through us on our behalf. 
to facilitate a transformation in us. So the process for deliverance, it can be a sudden transformation that is revealed instantly. You decide you want to stop smoking. And you smoke that last cigarette, and that's it, it's done, one and done, you never smoke again. That can be a form of deliverance. Someone else might decide to stop smoking, and it's a process that reveals itself over time. They smoke that last cigarette, and then they move on to the gum, and then the patch, and then whatever else they got to do. And sometime, eventually, they've smoked that last cigarette. Still a form of deliverance. So whether it's instant or whether it's a progression over time, deliverance does come. Last thing that I want to say about deliverance, well, two more things. And I wouldn't say that they're necessarily scriptural. They're just words that I'm going to use as I was studying the scriptures to try to um, help me understand the difference. So I call them the categories of deliverance. And there's two that I could see, supernatural and natural. So let's do supernatural first because that's easy to understand. Supernatural deliverance is a result of God's divine power and intervention in a supernatural, unexplainable way. Divine supernatural deliverance usually occurs in situations that are completely beyond our natural ability to control it or to influence it. That's why I called it supernatural. Um, give you an example. If you go to the book of Daniel, we're not going to read it now because it's a big book, but if you read chapter 3, you read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, these are three, um, these are three young men who have been exiled from Jerusalem and are captive in, ba in Babylon. This is what God was telling Solomon back in Chronicles. God knew this was going to happen one day. Well, these three young men, they loved the Lord, and they stuck to their principles, and they worshiped God. They didn't care what was going on. They didn't care what the world had to say about it. They didn't care what King ne Nebuchadnezzar had to say about it. They refused to bow down to him because Nebuchadnezzar thought he was God. So they refused, and for their obedience to God, they were rewarded with a trip to the fiery furnace. Wow, God, that's kind of rough, right? But see, God looks after his own. So three men went into that furnace, but th four men were saw walking around that furnace. Divine, supernatural deliverance. There was nothing they could have done to avoid, avoid those flames. That required God's intervention and God alone. Same thing happened in chapter 6 with David, similar thing, right? David refused to bow down and conform to the ways of the world. And so when the king issued an edict that said nobody could pray to anybody except him, David, true to his relationship with God, went home, stood in front of the window, and prayed to Yahweh, the one and true God. That earned him a visit to the lion's den. And the interesting thing about it was the king didn't want to put him there. It was a big old conspiracy for some haters who didn't like David, I mean, um, who didn't like Daniel, who wanted to get rid of Daniel. So, but Daniel was a prayer, he was a faster, and God takes care of his own. So when the king came back the next day to see what happened, because the king liked David, I'm um, Daniel, he did not want to do this, but he felt he had to do it to keep his word, to save face. So Daniel was a... Uh, um, um, Daniel, I keep saying Daniel. Daniel was a person who loved God, who prayed and fasted, and he worshiped God. So that night, while Daniel was fasting, so was the lion. Because when the king got there in the morning, Daniel was fine. Divine supernatural deliverance. So the king. Once he realized the conspiracy, he wasn't happy about that because Daniel was his friend. So the three people that conspired to put Daniel in, to get Daniel in the lion's den, the lions fasted the night before. They had breakfast in the morning because those men went in, but God's deli divine deliverance did not go in with them. So supernatural deliverance is easy to recognize because we know it's all about God. 
and we really didn't have anything to do with it. And the New Testament gives us scriptures. There's all kind of scriptures in the Bible where Jesus is healing people. People are passing by, touching his garment and being healed. Um, he's raising people from the dead. He's restoring. And it's not just Jesus. Jesus, after he goes, we've got Peter and Paul and his, his um, apostles. They're doing the same thing. They're laying hands on people and healing them. So God's working all the time. Um, Let's see here. What about now? Modern day, right? Is there some supernatural deliverance going on in, in, in modern day? I would say yes. Is there some supernatural healing happening for us here today? I would definitely say yes. Give you an example. About five years ago, I'm in Kaiser listening to doctors tell me that my 34-year-old daughter who cannot talk, who is brain damaged because her heart just suddenly stopped for no apparent reason, and they're preparing us. They're preparing the family. They say, hey, you, you, might, you need to get used to this. She's going to need somebody to feed her and to take care of her, and she probably will never walk again, and she probably will never talk again. That's what the doctors were saying, and you know what? When you looked at her, that's the way it looked, too. But God is good, and his deliverance is supernatural. His healing can be supernatural. Seven weeks later, she walked out of there, walked out, talking. <laughs> Five years later, she's feeding herself and her three babies. She's going to school, and she's working. So God still does supernatural healing, supernatural deliverance today. We hear about it all the time, right? Have you ever driven down the road and you've seen a car that's so mangled up, and then you see the people standing around, and you're like, how did they walk out of that? That was divine. That was God inter intervening on their behalf in a way that didn't have anything to do with them. Had to be God, all God. Um, so that's all I'm going to say. I think we get the picture as far as supernatural deliverance goes. So let's talk about what I call natural deliverance. First of all, it is still divine because it is the result of the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. However, it also involves our own natural effort and personal commitment. It involves us making a conscious choice to yield to the Holy Spirit that's in us and to walk in the freedom and the victory that Jesus has already won for us. See, when Jesus died, Every wound that his body took, every drop of blood that was spilled, was to pay the cost for us that we owe so that we could actually walk in this freedom, that we could be free from the traps and the debt and the penalties of sin. He died and he rose again, conquering sin and death so that we could be free to live. And I don't mean just be alive, but to truly live in him. Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. There's that word again, synonymous with deliverance. Because of what Jesus went through, we are healed. We are delivered. We are free from the traps and the things that entangle us in this world. But... Our participation is often key to experiencing the victory and the deliverance that Jesus has already won for us. And we do this through our choices and through our actions. Our deliverance can be as simple as making a decision to submit to God's will instead of the will of our flesh. And allowing the Spirit of God in us to strengthen us so that um, to perform, to strengthen us to perform God's will instead of our own will. The Apostle Paul said it like this in Philippians 2.13. I'm reading from the Amplified. I, I love the Amplified. It breaks things down. So Philippians 2.13 2, um, says, For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing, and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. 
So basically what it's saying is God is working in us. And when we have a desire to do what's right, it's because the Holy Spirit in us gave us that desire to do what's right. It's nothing good in our flesh, right? Left to our own design, we want to do what we want to do, how we want to do it. But the Holy Spirit gives us the desire to do what God wants to do. And he doesn't just give us the desire. If we will allow him and if we will yield to him, he will strengthen us and actually give us the ability to be successful. That's what Philippians 2.13 is telling us. So here's an example. Let's say we made a choice to stop doing something, whether it's drinking, smoking, cussing, you know, sexual immorality. It doesn't matter. Fill in the blank with whatever you want. But we've actually decided that we're going to stop doing it. And not only did we make that decision, we actually succeeded in, the in, in, in achieving this transformation and this change. It may have been an instant transformation. Whoop, just happened. Or it may have required a little bit more of a process of transformation that took place over time. But the bottom line is we wanted to change, we yielded to the Holy Spirit, and we were successful in that transformation. But the reason why is because it was a result of our making some different choices. We started doing new things. We started doing different things, going different places, hanging out with different people. And maybe if we didn't start doing anything different, maybe we stopped doing some things different. Maybe we stopped making some bad choices. We stopped going to the wrong places. We stopped hanging out with the wrong people. With natural deliverance, we need to participate in the process of, transform uh, as of transforming our lives. Uh, so when we make these different decisions and we per perform these different actions, we're actually now able to naturally experience God's deliverance. So the Holy Spirit gave us the will. The Holy Spirit gave us the desire. The Holy Spirit even gave us the strength and the ability to achieve. It's still divine deliverance because we couldn't have done it without the Holy Spirit. But it does require our natural participation, right? Didn't, by surrendering our will and embracing God's will, that's what enabled us to walk in God's deliverance. This kind of deliverance, natural deliverance, is a choice. We must participate in the experience or in the process to experience delivery or deliverance and to walk in victory. Okay, so I said we talk about four spiritual truths that we need to embrace in order to put us in a position where we can do these things because it's not easy. And I think it's important to say that because, see, God does not, does not call us to perfection. He's not, that's not what he's saying. But he is calling us to participation. He wants us to do some things. So we weren't told to be perfect, but he did say, be my partner. Work with me. So the first spiritual truth that's going to help to live and to develop a sound foundation for walking in God's deliverance, for walking in victory, is understanding that prayer is essential especially praying for deliverance. Jot down some scriptures. I'm going to go through them quickly. But in Matthew 6, chapter 6, verse 13, Jesus teaching the disciples how to pray. So if Jesus is teaching it, it must be important. And Jesus teaches them to pray for deliverance. So there's something you want God to deliver you from. You need to pray for God to deliver you from that specific thing. Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. Got to pray for it. Back on March 28th, Pastor did a service on deliverance and prayer. And he talked about realms. Most of you who were there, remember, he talked about God's up here in the supernatural realm, and we're here in the natural realm. And he talked about how prayer shifts atmospheres. And we just said that if you want to be delivered, you need to pray for deliverance because deliverance prayers break the legal right that the enemy has to operate in our lives. Because this is the enemy's realm down here. The natural realm is where Satan gets to rule and reign. But when we pray deliverance prayers, we break his legal right to interfere in our lives. And when we pray deliverance prayers, we actually invite God to come down into this realm and to intervene on our behalf, especially when the enemy is operating illegally. So prayer is important. 
Another thing we need to know about prayer is we just don't pray. We need to pray God's will, right? We, a lot of times we want to pray and we want to tell God how to do it and when to do it and where to do it and how long to do it. And we want to give God every last detail of how he is to answer our prayer. But that's not the way it goes. We pray God's will in faith. If you look at 1 John 5, 14 through 15, here's what it says. It says, this is the confidence that we have in him. The him in this scripture is God. So I'm going to read this my way, and I'm going to insert God everywhere I see him. This is the confidence that we have in God, that if we ask anything according to God's will, God hears us. So if we know that God hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have whatever we asked of God. It's got to be about his will, and it's got to be with faith. So praying with faith, though, does not excuse us from our participation in the process. So we place our faith in God to answer our prayers. That does not excuse us from not doing what is necessary in accordance with the faith that we have in our prayer. One quick example. We're praying for improved finances. So we, A, got to believe that this is God's will. It absolutely is. God doesn't want his people in debt. And we have to believe in faith that God's going to improve our finances. He's going to remove us from debt. Now we need to act in accordance with that prayer. That means you need to cut up the credit card, stop hanging out at the mall, stop buying things that we don't need, stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. We need to do some stuff different. We can't pray for, for, for improved finances, and we're still hanging out at the boat shop or, I don't know, the motorcycle shop, whatever it is that tempts you and tickles your fancy. We can't stop, we can't keep hanging out with our free spenders. Get bored, don't go to the mall, go to the park. You know, you might spend $1.50 on an orange creamsicle when the ice cream truck passes by, but that beats the heck out of us spending three fifty dollars on the coach bag that's sitting on the window marked down to three fifty. So it's all about us participating. We, wanna, we want some deliverance, we want to pray, we want to pray in faith, we still got to act accordingly. All right, so we know that prayer is essential to building this strong foundation. Second thing, this one's fun, submission and obedience to God. See, God doesn't act contrary to his will. God's response to our prayers are hand in hand with our response to his will. Submission and obedience to God, first of all, it helps us to live by God's will because God's not going to have us do anything he doesn't want us to do. Submission and obedience to God also keeps us from ending up in the wrong place at the wrong time in all kind of trouble. So let's talk about Jonah for a minute. Chapters 1 and 2, if you don't know the story of Jonah, read chapters 1 and 2. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and to cry out to the people, to talk about repentance. Jonah didn't want to do that. He decided he would go ahead and disobey God. So he gets on a ship. He goes to Joppa, wherever that is, and he gets on a ship that's headed for Tarshish. My guess is it's probably as far away from Nineveh as it can possibly be because he's trying to get away from God. Now, here's what's interesting. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He sees everything. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. So Jonah is going to try to hide from God. So Jonah goes to Tarshish. He gets on the ship. He's trying to get to Nineveh. Instead, Jonah's disobedience causes him to get tossed into a raging sea where he almost drowns and swallowed by great fish. Now, of course, he repented and cried out to God, and God delivered him and saved him. But, you know, had he just obeyed God, He could have avoided so much trouble. Another thing about submission and obedience, it doesn't just keep us out of trouble. It doesn't help us. It helps the people that are around us. I'm going to throw out a term and see if you know it. Collateral damage. Have you ever been in trouble because you were just with the wrong person? You were too close. You didn't do anything. So think about it. Jonah is the one that was supposed to be in 
Nineveh. Not the people on the ship. God was okay with them going to Tarshish. But because Jonah was there in their presence, they're now dealing with his mess, right? They're now dealing with the possibility of the ship being destroyed and their lives in danger because of what somebody else did. So when we are obedient to God, we not only protect ourselves, but we could be protecting our friends and our loved ones as well. So here's the thing about God when it comes to deliverance. We talked about it, right? It can be this process that's instant, or it can be this process that's over time. But God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. We know he can snap his finger and does what he wants in an instant. He can deliver us just that fast. However, in most cases, God chooses, God chooses to respond according to our submission and our obedience to the Holy Spirit that's in us. That's a choice that God chooses to make. And over and over again, as I search through the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, I read about how important God's uh, obedience and submission is to God. And this is where God specifically talks about how he blesses those. So I'm going to give you some scriptures to write down that specifically talk about blessings associated with submission and obedience. Old Testament, Genesis 22, verse 18. God's talking to Abraham. He says, all through, all, all, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed. In the Amplified Bible, in the Psalms, Psalms 128, verse 1, it says, Blessed, happy, and sheltered by God's favor is everyone who fears the Lord and worships him with obedience. So obedience is also a form of worship. Proverbs 8.32, chapter 8, verse 32. Now, therefore, listen to me, O you children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Keeping God's ways is just another way of saying blessed are those who are obedient. It's not just Old Testament. God's the same yesterday, for day, and forever. God blesses people in the New Testament. Jesus is walking through the crowd with, the, with his disciples. And a woman calls out. She's calling out to Jesus, but she's actually giving this prayer about Mary or this blessing about Mary. So she says, blessed is the womb that birthed you. Blessed is the breast that fed you. And Jesus responds, but even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. I think it's clear that we, are, we know we are under the, this, new, this new covenant of grace, right? There's freedom in Christ. That's true. God loves us. He forgives us. His grace has no, no, no bounds. But God expects us to be obedient. He expects us to live that life that he called us to live. And it's, not, and it's all through the Bible. We get all the way to Revelations. John, the apostle John is on an island all by himself. The Holy Spirit inspires him to write the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, that's great, and who keep what is written in it. So basically what he's saying is God will bless those who spend time reading the Bible and who follow what it says. God is not interested in the act of us just simply hearing his word or reading his word. He's also interested in how we apply what we've read. This is the teaching that James t teaches to new believers in James chapter 1, verse 22, when he says, be doers, not hearers only. So here's a problem. Many of us as Christians, we want to live our lives, our ways, according to our own rules and our own desires. And then we want to come running to God when times are tough and we're in trouble. And we fully expect God to keep his promises that he made to us. Right? We're strong Christians. We're walking on faith. And we do expect him to keep those promises, despite the fact that we often ignore the requirements that he has of us. Because a lot of God's promises are conditional. See, salvation is unconditional. You don't do anything to earn that. That's a free gift. But promises, there's some conditions usually attached. Let's go back to that very first one when God was talking and responding to King Solomon in Second Chronicles. God made three promises in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 
verse uh, 14. God promised that he would hear the cries of the people, that he would forgive them their sins, and that he would heal their land. He would restore them out of captivity. Those are his promises. But he has some conditions attached because that scripture starts with two little letters. If. If it's a conditional conjuncture, it says you need to do something. You need to do something first. So God had four things he wanted them to do. He wanted them to humble themselves. That means put aside their wills and their desire and do what he wants. Make him first. He wanted them to pray. I think we said enough about prayer. It's important. He wanted them to seek his face. He wanted them to look to him as their source and not to the idols and a ball or whoever the people were worshiping. He wanted them to seek him. And he wanted them to turn away from their wicked ways. He wanted them to stop doing those things he asked them not to do and to start doing what he wanted them to do. Then, then and only then, was he going to hear their cries? Was he going to forgive them and then heal them? So we got to remember, God gives us his promises, but he usually wants us to do something first. We got to stop asking, insisting that God keep his part of the deal when we don't keep our part of the deal. All right, so we're building this foundation. We know that prayer is important. We got to have a strong prayer life. We know that obedience is important. And that's where our blessings come from. Third thing, forgiveness. Uh-oh. Forgiveness is essential. It's an essential truth for building a strong foundation for living a life of divine deliverance. First of all, Jesus teaching his, disi his, his disciples to pray. He teaches them to forgive. He says in Luke 11, 4, um, he teaches them to pray for forgiveness of their sins and to forgive everyone who is indebted to them. Or in other words, who has sinned against them. Now, understand that unforgiveness is a sin that's owed to God. That's why Jesus came, because we owed God a penalty for our sins. And Jesus came, he paid that penalty, and we were forgiven. So unforgiveness is a sin that's owed to God. Far be it from us to request that God forgive us our debts, and we're not willing to forgive others their debts to us. The word debt or debtors is synonymous with sin. So if you look at the same scripture in Mark 6, 12, Mark says it like this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So forgiveness is not optional. It's a commandment and a requirement of God. Colossians 3.13 says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. That's a, that's, a strong, that's a strong requirement. But here's the thing that's important about forgiveness. It's the key to our own deliverance. Forgiveness frees not only our debtor, the person who's wronged us, but it also, when we choose to forgive, we also free ourselves. We free ourselves um, from anger. We free ourselves from hatred and resentment and from our need for revenge or to get even. Because those are heavy burdens and weights to, to, to carry around. Unforgiveness is a type of bondage. When we fail to forgive, we not only keep this person, we're holding them hostage, but we're also um, keeping ourselves in bondage. Forgiveness is what frees us and allows us to move forward. Can you just imagine how hard it is to move into a new relationship when you're dragging around the baggage and the hatred and the resentment from the old relationship? You're treating the new person like they did what the other person did. We got to let go of stuff. We got to let go of stuff. We got to release it because that's what allows us to move forward. It is through, oh, don't want to forget this. God has forgiven and not condemned us. Likewise. We need to forgive and not condemn others. We said that, right? Let's not forget to not forgive ourselves. So many of us hold ourselves in bondage. We are our own worst enemy. We think about what we did in the past, and we say, I can't serve in the church. God, man, I used to do X, Y, and Z. I can't 
speak a word of encouragement to this brother or this sister because you know what? I used to do A, B, C. We are constantly re- holding ourselves in shame and regret that God let go of and forgot about a long time ago when he ushered us into his kingdom. So forgiveness is not just for everybody else. We got to learn how to forgive ourselves. The Apostle Paul said it like this. Now, if you know Paul, then you know Paul was busy crucifying Christians before God met him on the road to Damascus and opened his eyes spiritually. But Paul says, I don't look back on the past. I look forward and I run the race in front of me. Can, how, how effective would Paul have been carrying the gospel to the Gentiles if he was still wallowing in guilt and shame from all the persecutions that he did prior to meeting Christ? Let it go. Forgive yourself. Move on. It's okay. God forgave you. Hold your head high. And don't let nobody shame you with those, girl, remember when you used to do this? And man, remember when you used to do that? No, I don't remember. God forgot and so did I. Simple. All right. So we're talking about four things that we're going to do, four spiritual truths that are going to allow you to live in in victory, to experience deliverance. Fourth truth, we need to understand and embrace and accept the fact of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the most important person responsible for exemplifying God's heart for deliverance. Christ is the word for anointed. It means Messiah. It refers to the work Jesus came to do. Jesus came to deliver us. He came to set us free. Christ is the cornerstone upon which every other spiritual truth rests. Without Christ in our lives, it is impossible to embrace and build upon the other three spiritual truths. Without Christ in your life, you cannot have an effective prayer life. If you don't know Christ without Christ in your life, obedience, kiss it goodbye. It's not going to happen. Because you don't have the Holy Spirit, and we've already said it, it's the Holy Spirit that gives you not only the will and the desire, but also the ability. So without Christ, you have no Holy Spirit, and without the Holy Spirit, you can kiss obedience goodbye. Without Christ, forgiveness, please. It's hard for some of us to operate in forgiveness with Christ. So... Christ is the cornerstone. He is that solid rock. We've got to build on that foundation. And Jesus exemplifies everything. Let's look at him. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus demonstrated consistent, strong prayer life. He, the, the New Testament is full of scriptures where Jesus is going off somewhere on a mountain or in a boat or wherever to pray all by himself. Then you get scriptures where Jesus is praying in crowds, praying for people. John. 17, 126, 1 through 26, those are the verses. It's called the high priestly prayer, and it is the longest prayer of Jesus in all of the Gospels. In that prayer, Jesus prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and get this, he prayed for you and me. He prayed for and interceded for future believers. That includes us, and that includes anybody that comes after us, generations to come, right up until his return. That's how important prayer is, and Jesus exemplifies it. Second spiritual truth, we talked about total submission, right? Jesus demonstrated a life of total submission and obedience. John 1, verse 29, talks about Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So in the Old Testament, when you sin, you had to bring a lamb to the priest who would sacrifice the lamb so that your sins would be forgiven. And the lamb had to be perfect without spot or blemish. That means nothing could be wrong with this lamb. That's Jesus. He's the lamb of God. He's perfect without spot or blemish. There's no sin in Jesus. 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 22 says, He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. There's other scriptures. Write down 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 21, talks about how Jesus had no sin. Hebrews, chapter 4, 15, talks about how Jesus could relate to us because he experienced everything we did. He, ex- he, he empathized with us, yet he didn't sin. 
Jesus in the garden praying before the Roman soldiers come to get him. We know that prayer. Father, if there's any way this cup can pass, let it happen. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Jesus is exemplifying submission and obedience right there, even unto death. There's a whole other teaching I could do on this scripture. I love it, but it would add uh, like another hour to this, to this message. So it had to be something different. But the point is, Jesus is our example of what submission looks like. How many of us is going to climb up on a cross or allow ourselves to be nailed to a cross to, to, to pay a price for something that we didn't do? That is sub that's submission and obedience um, to the nth degree. Lastly, Jesus, con uh, he demonstrated total and unconditional forgiveness. He gave his life and he shed his blood for the sole purpose of forgiveness. Matthew 26, verse 28 teaches us, he gave his life and shed his blood for the sole purpose of forgiveness. It says, for he's, he's um, in the upper room with the apostles. This is before he goes and allows himself to be taken by the Roman soldiers. And he says to his apostles, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was so forgiving, and he exemplifies forgiveness so much that even on the cross, he's still showing us how to forgive. He's looking down at the very people that are killing him and crucifying him. Then he looks up to God, and he says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Forgiveness. We, need, we want to, to live a, a life of victory. We want God to deliver us. We need to have this foundation. We need to have a prayer life, a good prayer life, a consistent prayer life. We need to be in obedience and submission to God. We need to be seeking him and doing what he wants and not what we want. We need to be able to forgive people. It's our forgiveness that God uses. Um, he, he says, the scriptures say that if you forgive, you will be forgiven. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. So forgiveness is important. Now, last, I said Jesus exemplified everything. We talked about three. Last one. The most important truth of all is that Jesus is our deliverer. See, so for those of us who've already placed our belief and trust in him, he has redeemed us from eternal death and damnation and separation from God. And he's placed us into e a position for eternal life. So we know this is not our home. This isn't permanent. We know when we leave here, we spend eternity in the presence of God. Christ is the cornerstone. He's the solid rock upon which the strong foundation of deliverance is built because he is our deliverer. That's why he came. All right. I just want to end today with two exhortations of encouragement. See, God has a heart for deliverance. Um, and because he desires to deliver his people, his heart is full of love and grace and mercy. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, we know it, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 10. For we are saved by grace, I'm sorry, by faith, through grace. And that is not of ourselves; it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk with them. So here's my encouragement. For those of us who already know Christ and we've already put our faith and our belief in him, then I want to encourage us to continue to grow in Christ, 
to continue to grow in our knowledge of the heart of God because that's what keeps us in the will of God. So I want to encourage us to begin to stop asking God to excuse the disobedience in our hearts because we're seeking permission or approval to pursue our own will. So may we stop saying, but God, you know my heart. God, God knows my heart. Instead, can we allow the Holy Spirit to, a greater, to have a greater influence over our continued growth and our submission and obedience to the will of God? So instead of saying, yeah, but God knows my heart, maybe we can start saying yes and amen. We need to start saying, here I am, Lord, send me. You need somebody to serve in the children's ministry? Here I am, God, send me. You need somebody to give her their time and their talents and their treasures? Here I am, God, use me. Not, well, God, you know how busy I am. And I really want to, but you, Lord, I know you're working on me, but you know my heart. You know, we need to stop doing that. God's calling us to something greater. We need to start saying, yes, God, amen, here I am, send me. Last, if today you're here and you don't know Christ and you've not placed your trust and your belief in him, then I want to encourage you to take the first step towards making the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. See, Jesus loves you. He died for you. And he wants to deliver you. So may you accept this gift of salvation and receive the most important deliverance that you will ever experience. So being delivered from cigarette smoke and drinking and, I mean, all that's nice. But being delivered from the sin and death and damnation, that's way better. So let's start with the most important deliverance, which is Christ. Let's get that. Because once you get that, God take care of the rest of it if we will just partner with the Holy Spirit and allow him to do his job. So, I want you to begin this process so you can start your lifelong journey in getting to know the heart of God, to getting to understand and develop a relationship with God, with Jesus the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to deliver your word this day, Lord. I pray, God, that your word uh, fell on a field of heart that is prepared and is good ground. And I pray, God, that you would send laborers into your field to cultivate it and to water it. And I thank you, God, that you and only you can receive an increase from it. And most of all, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart is acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.